Wait, Step YouTuber, what are you doing? Season 6, not bad. Season 8, bad. Season 7, not great. But season 6? Season 6, good. It has explosion scene, and cool shot in battle, and tear-jerking timey-wimey twist. You'd have to be some kind of completely heartless, emotionally devoid, logic-obsessed robot to think season 6 isn't great. How dare you speak precisely the truth, Epi? That's right, Strawman. Now, hush. Be gone with you, and don't come back until it's convenient for the plot. For now is the time of reckoning, and I'm reckoning that season 6 isn't all that it's cracked up to be. But look at me, getting all ahead of myself and such. It's been a good few years since the darn thing aired, so maybe a refresher course is in order. You know, just so we're all clear on where the previous season left off. What now? Only reason. Ahem. <clears throat> Season 5 kinda sucked, the one true king got well cucked, Jon Snow stabbed by Alyssa. Miranda probably should've ducked, Ollie also can get fucked, that's Jamie oh, fucking nice. Lannister. Sunspear was completely droll, storytelling black hole, but at least Bronn pitched a semi. Cersei loses all control, has herself a lengthy stroll, where the fuck is Lena's Emmy? Jorah puts the dwarf in strife, Marge and Tommen's married life. Homeless guy delivers speech, small man captured on a beach. Ass cheek birthmark shaped like Dawn, it's all one big debacle. Varys fucking teleports, oysters, clams, and cockles. Aemon dies from being old, Barristan no longer bold, Peter's brain can't work in cold, so to the Bolton, Sansa's sold. I is blind, I've lost my mind in the house of black and white. Mother Mole, daddy's home, prepping for the long night. Lancel's large, dwarf heads, phantom twitch in Theon's crotch. John's in charge, John's dead, he did it all for the watch. Daughter dead, dragon dance, granny flayed, who told? Splattered head, Merrin Trant, understand? Too old. old. Little deer overcooked, major plot holes overlooked. Talk to the golden hand. Has anybody seen Brad? Oh god. The best season of Game of Thrones opens with a slow zoom on Jon Snow's corpse left out in the open. My first reaction to this is that leaving the victim of your mutiny out in the open is kinda stupid, but I guess leaving him under a sign that reads traitor communicates a pretty strong message. Then again, so does killing the guy, and given how little anybody understands about the properties of white raising, leaving old Jono out here does seem a little really fucking stupid. Thorne later shows no issue in admitting his part of the mutiny. Who killed him? I did. So Clearly the move wasn't to maintain anonymity. I don't know, it just seems kinda extremely ill-conceived. When moving his body, or covertly burning him, or burying him, or something like that would do a lot to slow down the resistance to Thorn and his men, which, might I add, does lead to their executions. Anyway, that's the first shot. Dave shows up, God knows why he's still at Castle Black and why he didn't leave as soon as he found out Stannis, Shireen and Selyse were all dead. You know you're a Lord Davos, of like, an actual place that needs attending to? You know you have a wife, right? Who you love? You love your wife. I do. I just feel like he should be taking this more seriously because not just everyone can be a Lord. Well, I mean, I can. And so can you. What a segue! That's right, with established titles you can earn the esteemed title of Lord or Lady without the hassle of losing any of your finger bones. If your demands for respect are sorely lacking any legitimacy, established titles is the thing for you. Now you can insist that waiters refer to you by a landed title and you don't even have to worry about scheming servants or rival lords eyeing your fields. All the fun of being a Lord without any of the hassle of being a lord. Okay, so here's how the whole thing works. Customarily, the owner of a Scottish estate is referred to as the Scots analogue of lord, which if I try to pronounce, you'll laugh at me. Through established titles, you can buy a teeny tiny plot of land in beautiful... This place, which for like four centuries was the capital of Scotland. And you get a certificate proving your lordly authority. Something for your many children to one day go to war over. So yeah, the whole thing's a lot of fun, but the best part is that established titles is also a conservation effort based in the woodlands of Scotland. Every order helps preserve this irreplaceable landscape. They partner with global charities One Tree Planted and Trees for Future to plant trees around the world. So, you want to be a lord? Establish titles. Want to preserve nature? Establish titles. Out of ideas for a gift? Establish titles. Seriously, it's perfect. With the couple title pack, you can get one for yourself and your partner. Or like, I don't know, make your parents a lord and lady. That could be cute. You now have two choices. You can either go to EstablishTitles.com slash Glidus and use the code 
code GLIDUS10 at checkout for 10% off of your lordship, or you can continue being lame and not a lord. Ghost is upset about something, and his whinging alerts Davos, who finds the thing, and this is exactly why they should have moved the body, or at least stayed there and camped it, if anonymity wasn't important to them, which we know it isn't. I did. Like, you know that there are honourable men at Castle Black loyal to Jon. I think the main issue I'd take with this is that in the previous three seasons he was in, Alyssa Thorne was not portrayed as a colossal doofus. And this is a decidedly boneheaded thing to do, and he only does it to allow for the plot to occur. You know, initially I was going to mock the writing for the miraculous coincidence that the people who happen to find John's body are his friends, but then I realised that of course they would be because all the people who hate John pointlessly abandoned his corpse and ran off to play tiddlywinks in the Castle Black rec room. Ed is upset about something and his whinging alerts Davos who asks him who he can trust out of all the people at Castle Black, and he says, The man in this room. Which, like, we, we saw them come into the room from the courtyard, which they came to from a few different directions. I would understand if Ed is just trying to curry favour with or keep suspicions low about people he doesn't exactly trust, but as we see going forward, this isn't a thing and he actually does trust all these guys and they are trustworthy and they all happen to find their ways into this room from all across the castle and not a single person Ed trusts didn't find their way into this room. Also, we don't know any of their names. Who are you people? After the knock at the door, they let the episode's title in, assuming for some reason that Alyssa hadn't led her there with a blade at her back. She already knows exactly what's happening because... So Alyssa flatly admits to murder, mutiny, and treason in front of a room mostly full of people who didn't want those things to happen. I did. He delivers a decent speech in justifying his crimes, but people should still be furious regardless of how drastic Jon's actions as Lord Commander were. I feel like an actual conflict here where Thorn forcibly seizes control of the castle would do a lot for legitimising his coup, and to really light a burner under Ed's resistance. It would also make Alyssa not just storming Davos's room later on more believable if a lot of his allies are killed or wounded in a battle here. But then the issue is that Alyssa is the only person the audience knows in this room, aside from Ollie, who is a child. So maybe instead of Ed and Davos both finding Jon, only one of them does, and the other is the voice for Jon in this conflict. Ed naps off to fetch Tormund, making it out of Castle Black with ease, because it actually isn't the ruthless, impassioned, and wrathful Sir Alyssa Thorne they're up against. It's the bumbling, lazy, inattentive Mr. Alistair. You know, for the best season of Game of Thrones, it does start off a bit horrifically clumsy. I did. Let's see how the rest goes. Meanwhile, at the castle of Winterfell, Ramsay grieves for Miranda, and if you've seen my big boy ranking video about this show, then you already know my thoughts on this scene. It is good, and in many ways, it is also not bad. This series makes a point about villains not being straightforward. The villainous forces in season one, for example, Cersei, Peter, Miri, Alyssa, Tywin, they all turn out to have understandable, human, and sometimes even noble motivations. Hell, this is the show that makes you feel upset when this little piece of shit gets murdered. So in amongst the diminishing quality of writing, it's satisfying and complicated and interesting when one of the most reprehensible characters exhibits a revealing, vulnerable, heartfelt moment. It's a return to form and a narratively effective way of deepening Ramsay's motivations. Unfortunately, after this gem of a scene and an outstanding gut punch of a line, This is good meat. Feed it to the hounds. Miranda is never mentioned again. Not a point against this episode though. Great scene. Eon rocks. Michael McKelleton also rocks. Father and son discuss Stannis' death and House Bolton's future. Roose is calmly outraged at Ramsay and I really like his demeanour. This guy's a scene stealer. He outlines that they're no longer at peace with the crown, which makes you wonder what the long term plan is. Like, does Roose seek independence? With Sansa, they have a claim to Rob's kingdom, nah? That'd be interesting. Or is he planning on overthrowing Tommen and installing a friendlier regime? Fucking how? When you consider that Roos's only ally is Walder Frey, a dishonourable Weasley miser who is reliant on the crown to deal with his own problems, and also when you consider anything, Roos's rebellion makes nothing resembling sense. I understand using Sansa to establish legitimate rule of the North, but the Boltons lacking legitimacy is actually never mentioned once throughout this season, where they are both without any traditional claim to Winterfell and lacking any support from the crown. 
clown. Anyway, Roos also tells Ramsay that his inheritance is at stake after chastising him for losing his wife and his gimp, which I quite like as another motivation for Ramsay. Man, after covering season 7, I kind of forgot what a compelling villain is like. A finger in the bomb. And we arrive at the pursuit of Sansa and Theon. Castle Black has been tenuous, but not too silly, and Winterfell so far has been... hmm. Overall, not an awful start to the season, but this scene is where season 6 establishes itself as thoroughly piss-takeable. The Ice Cold River is a good set piece at least, it makes sense that they would do this and I'm not going to take issue with them not removing articles of clothing because you can literally hear the hounds getting closer. That's fine. Theon's sudden onset of bravery as he takes charge of the situation is also good. He finds a nice little den for them to freeze to death in, cute hug, and then the hounds show up even though the whole point of crossing the river was to throw them off. It's the only way to throw off the hounds. So how'd they do that? Okay, I know this has been done before, but take note that right now there are four mounted men and two men afoot, each with a doggo. Very clearly established in multiple shots. Six men, four horses, two good boys. Just... Keep that in mind. Then... <sighs> then fucking Brienne shows up, and by this mere act, she has already undone what was one of the best written stories of season 5. To elaborate, Brienne and Podrick failed miserably at keeping Arya safe, so they decide to spend season 5 tailing Sansa, because of, you know, the thing with the lady. Over the course of the season, the audience is reminded that Brienne swore an oath to Catelyn, and that she had great love for Renly and seeks vengeance against Stannis for his death. Two separate things that are of utmost importance to her. Hmm, I wonder what might happen if she was forced to choose between these two things. So she abandons her post to steal the Stannis kill, rude, narrowly missing out on Sansa signaling for rescue. Forced to choose between her oath-bound honor and her desire for revenge, Brienne chose vengeance, and so she doomed Sansa to a futile escape attempt with the decrepit, tortured, frail Theon. What's more, Stannis was already as good as dead without Brienne's intervention, so her actions aren't even functional. They're entirely emotional. So by giving in to her emotions, she has failed her honor-bound duty to protect Sansa. Bam! Set up. Choice consequences. Simple shit done well. A perfect little canvas on which we can now explore how an honor obsessed person reacts when they fail to meet their own standards. And what's the first thing season 6 does with this? There's not even an admission of fault. By the time this scene is over, Brienne's dilemma might as well have not happened at all. Cake had cake eaten. And look, a hero can wrangle their way out of an awful dilemma and tick both boxes, sure. I choose. Both. But without any semblance of growth or struggle to do so, betrays exactly how little attention and care is being given to a character. You're the worst character ever, Tally. Brienne chose to kill Stannis, but the writers needed someone to save Sansa and Theon, so she did that too, regardless of how much that ruins her story. When you have a character breaking not only the laws of physics, but also their own story just to help the plot out of the hole you wrote it into, you have fucked up. I'm gonna go ahead and say that Brienne finding Sansa in the wild for the second time now is downright fucking miraculous. At this point, there's no doubt that she has quest markers. How did she even know that Sansa was attempting an escape, having missed the candle? That was the whole point! Okay, here's how you fix this. If we're allowed to change the end of season 5, have Brienne choose Sansa instead of Stannis. It's pretty simple, because that's the story you run with anyway going forward. You completely ignore the Stannis thing. And Ramsay can kill Stannis, or he can live into season 6 and later be brought to justice by Brienne or Roos. There's plenty of sensible options there. Or even like she can delegate Podrick to save Sansa while she goes off to seek vengeance. That'd be fun. And if we can't change season 5, then just use the Ice River to throw off the hounds and buy them time to gain the lead, which you already did, and make it a Theon-centered escape attempt. So not only did they ruin Brienne's story, it was also completely pointless. Aren't you glad we're doing this instead of Meribold and Nimble Dick and Stoneheart? So that's Brienne's character assassinated, but if if you thought we were done with this scene, I've got some news for you. Let's think about Theon and how he reacts to Brienne and Podrick arriving and killing Ramsay's men. Keep in mind that he has no clue who these people are. And sure, Sansa has met them before, but he doesn't know that. To Theon, Brienne and Podrick are two complete strangers who came out of nowhere to murder Ramsay's men. Exactly this has happened before. In season 3, when Ramsay himself, who Theon didn't really know, appeared from nowhere to save him. This was so 
Joe Ramsey could earn his trust, learn valuable information, and then continue to torture him. This is incredibly traumatic for Theon. Here he is, three years later, put in what amounts to basically the exact same situation. And what does he do? What has he learnt from his past? What does he do to protect Sansa, his last connection to his surrogate family, his only hope at redemption, for whom he has just risked freezing to death, being devoured by hounds, or a lifetime of horrendous torture? Well, after joining in the fight, he stands on the sidelines, says nothing, and even encourages Sansa to accept Brienne. Ladies, gentlemen, this is a non-character. This is a prop the writers don't understand. This is something that used to be a person who is now a vacant vehicle for the plot. There is no Theon Greyjoy in this scene. If Theon Greyjoy were here, he would either express extreme distrust towards the strangers saving him, or fucking run the other way. We're fewer than 20 minutes into season 6, and two of the previous season's most promising characters have been utterly pulverized under the weight of a plot that cannot hold itself up. Good going. Brienne kills one dude, gets knocked to the ground, kills another dude, <laughs> yeah, kills the other dude who was just kind of watching. Pogdrick valiantly defeats his combatant. Theon picks up a sword that was definitely there the whole time and kills the fifth and final soldier. There were no more than that. Stop asking questions. And off screen, Sansa eats the hounds. She was hungry. This is nitpicky, but little gaps of continuity like this do contribute to a feeling of inauthenticity. Nitpicks are real and they do matter. You don't want nits, do you? If left unattended, they're gonna hatch into lice. Story lice. Anyway, after the fight, there's this cute little scene and I quite rate Gwendolyn's acting here. And I vow that you shall always have a place by my heart. Is this pledge like a common thing? Is Sansa somehow aware of the exact wording of what Kat said to Brienne four years ago, but not aware enough to know the whole thing? Meet and meet at my table. Meet and meet at my table. And Podrick knows it too. In season two, it seemed like Catelyn was just kind of riffing about what her relationship with Brienne would be like. I, I don't know, it just seems like you retroactively lessened a previous moment just to cheaply enhance this one. Also, Brienne neglects to mention to Sansa that her sister is alive. Like, she talks about it in the next episode, but surely that'd be a fucking awesome way to end this scene. She also doesn't mention that she killed the one true king. So, um, that's that scene. Here's another one. Jamie returns to King's Landing with his daughter's corpse and not Bronn. Wonder where he went. And he didn't send word ahead of time. Like, birds move faster than ships, yeah? And I get that it's sensitive news that Cersei would take better in person, but it's also incredibly important diplomatic information. And letting her get her hopes up about seeing her daughter only to be met with this just seems cruel. The end result is a knockout performance though. Like, holy shit, is Heedy incredible. Wow, if I had a nickel for every fantastically performed grieving scene in this episode, I'd have two nickels, which isn't a lot, but it's strange that it happened twice. Cersei tells Jamie the prophecy she's been living her entire life by, and he tells her that's stupid. Having lived the life he has, it's consistent characterization for Jamie to have this anti-prophecy, forge your own destiny kind of stance. Fuck prophecy. Fuck fate, fuck everyone who isn't us. So that's neat. This scene depicts a more vengeful Jamie who is passionately involved in his family, which is a logical development given that in the previous episode his daughter died in his arms. I deem this scene good. For some reason we cut to Yunella reading to Marjorie before Pope Francis steps in with a more gentle take on indoctrination. Midge wants to see Loris and understands that to get out of this bind she has to play along with his silly ideas about being a good person. Given that the High Sparrow is a pivotal antagonist for basically two seasons of the show and I haven't really had a chance to talk about him yet, I'm sure that there's a lot I could say about his character. Well, he's, I guess, you know, he's, he's old and he's dogmatic, and he drastically slows the pace of anything he touches. Ugh. Speaking of drastically slowing the pace, did you know that only 25% of you are actually subscribed to my channel? Meanwhile, in the city of Dawn- Oh my fucking god. As vengeance for House Martell, I have decided to murder all of House Martell. With no given impetus, Doran is telling Ilaria base level things about Oberyn over a year after his death on this random day, when there's probably more relevant things two humans would be discussing, such as the Martell-Lannister relations, for example. Fortunately for the show, these two actors are just wonderful to watch, even when given such vapid dialogue to work with. Your mother is a brilliant woman, you know that. 
Dude, didn't she just attempt to thwart the tentative peace you had established for your country in a comically haphazard way for which you heavily chastised her? Dude, didn't you not so long ago threaten to execute this woman for her outlandish plan to start a fucking war out of vengeance? It just seems kinda dog shit writing to refer to said woman as brilliant. Doran Martell is barely a character in this show and yet they still managed to undermine him. That can't be easy, bravo. <laughs> Hmm, Tyene is here, but neither of her sisters are. That's strange, I wonder where they went. Doran's maester, who might be Calliote, hands him a thing about the stuff, and Alexander Siddig makes this face. Thank you so much. So, Doran reads aloud that Marcella dead, and Ario Hotar, the seldom-spoken, halberd-wielding, badass bodyguard who we spent the entire previous season expecting to do something cool, is taken out by a single stab from a little girl with no struggle. Ow! My expectations! Ilaria pulls a short dagger from her bracelet, which is kinda cool, but then she stabs Prince Dawn of Dawn with it, which is kinda not cool. Tyene retrieves her weapon and throws it at the maester, which I don't exactly get, like wh what's that gonna change really? Maesters serve whoever holds a castle. You know how Lewin served Theon, and later on Walken serves Sansa, and Pycelle serves like five different kings? Killing this guy is not gonna stop people from thinking this was a coup. And then there's every guard in the water garden standing completely still while all of this happens. Mondays are my Right? I get that Ilaria goes on about how Doran is out of touch with his people, but these are palace guards who are sworn to him, right? And Ilaria's last plot didn't seem to have any guards on side. How the fuck did she organize all these men to play along with her sparkling violent insurrection? This woman couldn't organize the capture of a useless teenager, and all these guys are suddenly on board with her murdering the prince and being in charge of Dawn. Fuck Fuck this scene and fuck this guy. Fuck this one guy in particular. Oberyn Martel butchered and you did nothing. By tying Tristane to Marcella and the small council, Doran was successfully developing institutional change that would see Dawn's interests better represented and hopefully prevent the kind of bloodshed that Ilaria now demands vengeance for, without compromising the peace and stability of being under the Baratheon crown. Now, you could validly criticise that this is what Doran's mother tried to do with Elia and Rhaegar and look where that got us, but those circumstances were very different, and here Ilaria is saying that Doran did nothing, a claim which takes no effort to dismiss as bullshit. And she's supposed to be smart. Your mother is a brilliant woman, you know that. So take that, fictional character! Weak men will never rule Dorn again. It's so fucking weird to frame this murderous, idiotic seizure of control as a girl power moment. You go, queen. Like, holy shit, this is Dawn we're talking about. The one place where women actually do have some agency. If you want a toppling of the patriarchy moment, this is the one setting in your story where it doesn't work. Okay, but if you thought that was stupid, which... Come on, you did. Fucking check this out. Tristane is painting the eyes for Marcella's corpse, which is cute, but then, oh, that's where they went. I'm just gonna play this shot of Nymeria and Obaria standing on the pier as the ship Tristane, Jamie, and Marcella are on leaves dawn. Don't mind me, just B-roll honestly. And now they're in King's Landing. You know, all this time I was working under the assumption that there were only two jetpacks in Westeros, but I don't see how the Snacks could have acquired one of them, so there must be a third one somewhere. Maybe Oberyn picked one up on his many travels. This poor boy who just lost the girl he loved gets dishonorably skewered by his cousin. Play the laugh track. I cannot believe they played this for jokes. So it's blisteringly obvious that these scenes were sloppily cobbled together to get Dawn as far away from the plot as conceivably possible due to the backlash from season 5, which is why they're overflowing with nonsense and nonsense accessories. The only character anyone in the audience could have possibly had any investment in is Ilaria, who just cemented herself as a murderer and a twisted fucking psychopath. Over 10 million people watched this episode as it aired, and I can guarantee you that not a single one of them cried over Tristan Martell's death, except for those who think that Toby Sebastian is cute, which, yes. But if you close your eyes, does it almost feel ah. Marine. With quite the shakeup at the end of season five, let's see what the writers want us to expect from this plot for season six. Because you have no cock. Oh, it's a dick joke.
Thank goodness. I'd almost forgotten that Varys doesn't have male genitalia, and that that is funny. Thanks for reminding me, incredibly complex character Tyrion Lannister, in this, the best season of Game of Thrones. What? No. There's a translation joke about baby consumption that shows how out of touch Tyrion is, hinting towards the marine plot's main concern. How does a newly established, completely foreign, military-ish regime maintain peace and change the city's millennia-old way of life? when it's confronted with both domestic unrest and international pressure. Pretty complicated issue for Game of Thrones to be tackling. Can't wait to see the discussion on this topic and the solutions they propose. Okay, now is when you play the clip that ironically undermines what I just said. Then follow it up with some outdated reference that mocks what the audience just saw. Yeah, that'll make them laugh. Now you do the static thing and move on to the next bit. Then there's this. Misa means mother in Valerian. I know what Misa means. Now, before we get into it, I just want to emphasize that Tyrion and Varys are supposed to be two of the smartest characters in the show. Tyrion, born into the richest, most powerful family in Westeros, had a lord's education and continues to study all kinds of things well into his adulthood. While not fluent, he certainly has some grip on conversational Valyrian, enough to surely know basic common words, for example, those one might use to describe one's immediate family members. Varys spent much of his life on the eastern side of the narrow and thus would be intimately familiar with the Valyrian language family. As we just saw, he is well spoken enough in High Valyrian to communicate with this random Miranese woman. You know who else is really familiar with High Valyrian? This lady, the blonde dragon person. Yet Daenerys, who has spent all but the very first moments of her life in Essos, confidently speaks Valyrian. Let's see what she thinks when first presented with the word Misa. What does it mean? Oh. Oh. That's interesting. She's completely unfamiliar with the word. Strange. Well, what does this translation expert think about the word then? She's old Giscardi, Khaleesi. It's old fucking Giscardi! Different language! Completely unrelated language! Okay, actually, it's a loan word from the now dead old Giscari that has maintained its meaning in the modern day Low Valyrian dialects spoken in Yunkai Marine and presumably Astapor. But saying Misa means mother in Valyrian is quite a few leaps away from being a correct thing to say, and we should expect these two supposedly smart people with their given levels of familiarity with Valyrian to not say it. Especially when saying that Misa means mother in old Giscari is far more accurate. It's like a native English speaker saying Kiora means hello in English to someone who already knows English. Come to think of it, the audience also already knows what Misa means, unless they haven't seen season three. Have you seen season three? So what's the point of explaining this? We know what it means. Listen up, writing room, gentlemen and lady. Oh, no ladies. Oh, actually, that makes sense. Anyway, fellas, you have this strapping young lad on payroll who invented these languages. Why not just give him a call and ask him how your characters should discuss this particular word? It's just so fucking lazy. It would take like three minutes. I'm sure he's not that busy. Oh, wow, good for you. Anyway, that's that word. And after all that, I still think that the best bit is that these Miranese graffitists have decided to render their sentiments aside from the one old Kiskari loan word in the common tongue, which happens to be a language that none of them speak. If you're gonna have characters translate stuff anyway, why not have the whole thing written in the language it should actually be in? Oh my god. Then they listen to some boring guy, I don't- Oh look, the docks are on fire! Everything's happening today! And Tyrion's all quippy about it? Well. He won't be sailing to Westeros anytime soon. As if he's not currently adjacent to a very dangerous situation. <laughs> For all they know, there could be harpy dudes hiding down here who could just kill them at any moment. So I guess the thing here is that these people would absolutely not behave like this. And if you think for a single moment about the logic of the attack, it starts to fall apart because they want Daenerys and her forces gone, right? I know, let's destroy the means by which they could leave. We later find out that the Slaver's Bay merchants who fund the Harpies still want Daenerys gone on ships. These ships, the ones they just set on fire. <laughs> so uh, looks like Daenerys will be needing new ships, wink wink. Wonder how she's gonna sort that one out. <laughs> and so concludes the weekly adventures of Half-Man and Not-Man. It's a ram skull, you idiot. 
Oh my god, how stupid are you? Brain dead. Ram. Yeah, you tell him, Jora. They eventually find the breadcrumb Daenerys left for them, and the scenes betwixt aren't awful. The dynamic between Dario and Jora is unique across the show, and Mitchell Whisman's Dario is a lot of fun if you can clear the hurdle of how completely different he is to that fella in the Fat Man books. Hearing Dario's wish to see Daenerys' new world makes me weep for the scenes that could have been if only they hadn't thrown him away at the end of this season. But that's not this episode's fault. In the moment, it's a good idea, and this scene makes a fine establishment of this little adventure. I can't say the same for this, though. These gents are put in the unenviable position of having to speak Dothraki as well as Jason Momoa did, and while their performances range from okay to fine, it mostly just reminds me of how great Drogo was. The actual plot of the scene is sensible, with the Dothraki holding true to what we know about their societal institutions, but them learning about Danny being Drogo's widow here means that they didn't know who she was when they did this, so why did they do this? Do they randomly encircle anyone they encounter in the wild? Seems like a lot of wasted time and effort. The vulgar conversation between these idiots is, well it's more juvenile than a dream fan club and I can't help but picture the hours that professional adults spent writing these lines. And then there's a Monty Python skit inserted into the middle of a conversation about the fate of a fan favourite main character. Don't get me wrong, it's a funny joke, I just think that tonally it's a completely bizarre decision that deflates the threat of the Dothraki. Like, aren't these guys war criminals? Why are you portraying them as silly slapstick sidekicks? Mean hence, things in Bravos are weird and also dumb. Blind Aya is a destitute beggar on the streets, a development that requires either blatant disregard for the book plot or an immense misunderstanding of it. Or both, both works. A blind teenager being viciously assaulted in the streets is common enough of an occurrence that nobody seems to mind. The waif makes no sense, but we'll get into that later in the season when there's more to chew on. It's over before too long, which is a small mercy, but before we move on, I'd like to point out that it's basically here that the show decides that Arya is going to be a kick-ass superpowered assassin. This might seem like a strange place to declare that, but consider that in dance, Arya manages to work her way through the blind training by harnessing her abilities as a skin changer, not by becoming fucking daredevil. So by keeping the notion of blind Arya overcoming someone beating her with a nasty stick, but removing the core character component of her being a skin changer, the show is forced to come up with some other explanation for how she later succeeds in these fights. That being, she's a ninja now. Alistair has a bunch of guys pointing crossbows at the room John's corpse and friends are hanging out in. Presumably they were all distracted when Ed left earlier. Maybe they saw a bird. Thorny asks Dave if he can come out to play. He's going to allow Davos to travel south as a free man as though he's committed any crime. All he did was pick up a corpse and close a door. But I should shut up, because clearly Thorn is full of shit, in spite of him having never been full of shit at all up until this very episode. Davos hatches a sentence about the red woman maybe helping them somehow and vaguely alludes to her doing magic-y things. There's nothing wrong with an extreme circumstance forcing him to forget his disdain for magic to solve a problem, but there is something wrong with that problem being a guy he barely knew dying. People die all the time, Dave. Why is John so special? You learnt of Stannis' death last episode and you didn't- And also, so far as we know, Davos hasn't encountered the notion of resurrection ever at all, not a one time, nary a twice. So for him to assume that there's some possibility of indefinite article Scarlet Lady revibulating Jon Snow is just outlandicrous. It's a sad fucking statement of Dolores said is our only chance. Sorry, who the fuck are you? All these dudes literally facilitate the main character's resurrection and we never hear of them again because we never hear of Jon Snow's resurrection again because it's not at all relevant to the plot. They don't even have names. Names. Speaking of things that aren't at all relevant to the plot, we cut to season 6 episode 1, who turns out is old by the way. I don't know why she's removing her plus one necklace of age deceit if she does this before crawling into bed every night, or if it's just for the cameras, but what I do know is that it must be a recent development because she didn't seem at all affected by removing the necklace back in season 3. But look, I am willing to excuse this minor aesthetic inconsistency so long as it's in service of establishing an important piece of lore that will later pay off in a way that impacts anything? Hope I look that good when I'm 40. 
And that's it. That's The Red Woman, the initial installment of the best season of Game of Thrones. I did. It's, look, some scenes are fine, others are legitimately great, but the rest range from blatantly boring to aggressively awful. A bunch of time is wasted, a handful of characters are ruined with their plots thrown out the window, and a third thing that rounds out the summary. If this video gets more than six likes in the first minute, I'll do one for episode two. This Glimbus train is about to acquire its 50,000th passenger, and to celebrate, we're gonna be doing a big honkin' stream where I talk about a whole mess of theories, like, all the theories. If you want to submit a theory for discussion during that stream, you can do so using the Google form in the description below. So you should subscribe, really, truly, honestly, because we're not that far off the milestone. Then go ahead and follow me on Twitter and join the Discord server and eat a piece of fruit as a healthy and delicious snack. I forgot to do the patron readout. We got Agla here, Org, Glanus, Hoveram, Ingvold, Mormuths, QC Whitebird, Samsum, Shrimper Jr., Simcoe, Stay78, STL Guna, Waffle, and Ondi. Thank you all so much! So this is a message for everybody, which is to go and subscribe to Glidus' YouTube channel. Bye! You'd all better start calling me Lord Glimbus now, you hear?